Ahmed, take it away. Sure. All right. Welcome, everyone, uh, to GBG Cape Town's uh, meetup for September. Uh, we're touching it uh, mobile app delivery for Flutter. Um, yeah, so basically, who are we? Uh, who is GDG Cape Town? Uh, so we're an official Google Developer Group uh, chapter. We're self-organized and independent, but supported by Google, as well as our previous sponsors, Over, Luno, OfferZen, Flash Circle, Flame Link, Nomanini, and others. And you are free to talk to us about future speaking engagements or topics or sponsors. Um, just reach out to us. And um, if you want to uh, raise a question, um, so after the talk, uh, you can basically raise your hand, uh, raise your hand and then um, we'll then uh, allow you to, to, to raise your question. Okay, so who are the organizers? So we consist of Maya Krutipas, uh, Sylvia Dickman, Georgian Gete, Adrian Bunga, and me, Ahmed Tikiwa. And how do you get in touch with us? Well, on Twitter, it's at GDG Cape Town, or by email, GDG Cape Town at gmail.com. On Meetup, it's meetup.com, Google Developer Group Cape Town Meetup. And then we have a GDG platform, which is GDG community.dev and hashtag uh, GDG Cape Town. So on Zartec, which is on Slack, you can get in touch with us uh, using the GDG-CPT uh, channel, or you can ping one of the organizers. So today's agenda, we're going to have uh, Brad McCallum, who is going to be talking to us about the power and utility of Dart. And then we're going to have Sylvia, who will talk to us about hands-free app launching, uh, setting up the CI CD pipeline for a Flutter app. And then we're going to have a wrap-up. And um, well, we have one code of conduct, which is please be nice. And um, over to you, Brad. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm Brad Michal. Um I've been a Flutter developer for around about two years now. And I'm currently working at WiseTalk. Um, what I want to talk about today is Dart Defines, which is just a very simple way of passing in uh, variables into Dart from the, from, um, from the runtime. So let's start with me sharing some, my screen and I'll just take you through a PowerPoint. Can, can, can everyone see my screen? Okay, uh, so let's start with Dart Defines. Um, so setting up in Flutter. So the first thing you kind of want to do is just create a config file. Um, the way I do mine normally is anything, anything that's public, everything that's public, I just put above here. Um, these are things that I don't mind anybody seeing, such as the app name or just anything that I'm comfortable with being visible in the app. And then below these, these are basically my config, uh, my config variables, so app name, version name, version number, API key, and API suffix. These are things I would like preferably to keep private. Um, okay, so I just have an issue. Okay, there we go. So these are the things that I kind of would like to keep private. And I'm basically just gonna show how to use the config files inside of the app. So the first thing you need to do is, so this, you would, so this would be inside of the Gradle setup. Um, you would just create a dot environment variables. Um, this would just be your defaults for anything you, that you want to pass into Gradle. That is version number, version name, in the app suffix, so for example, if you want to do dot .dev, dot .production, dot .anything you can, you're thinking of. Um, this just helps being able to handle multiple apps with a shared code base, or to even manage different flavors. So if you want to do production and staging and testing, you can just pass in those, those values at runtime, and Gradle will handle everything for you. Uh, this is just a bit of Peter that you need. Unfortunately, <laughs> there is a bit of Peter that you have to handle inside of Gradle. Um, so when you, as soon as you pass in the variables into Gradle, you have to repopulate. You, you have to repopulate this array with the variables that you passed into Gradle from the terminal. And here you can see I'm just getting the variable from data finds over here and then splitting it, and so it's a map that you have to split on with the comma, 
and repopulate the array. And next, so this is, the, to me, this is probably the most interesting and best part of Flutter of Tarty Finds. Um, so instead of having to go into iOS and have to go into Android, this to me is the, the absolute power of, Flutter, of Tarty Finds. So if you look at the application ID suffix version code, version number, and the erase values and the alt trace. So you can add in, for example here, if you're doing a staging app, you can just, so this will just add the, the application ID dot staging dot production dot whatever flavor you can think of. And it will create an entire new app with a new package ID. And you can pass it in at runtime. The version code and version name, um, <laughs> I remember before dot defines, I kind of had to go into iOS and Android every time just to change those values. And it was quite a pity to do that. Right now, it's just one, one place I need to do it, and it pulls everything for me easy. Um, these things are coming as well. So you can also actually create variable names inside of the string if you do Android development. You can just create a variable inside of the string race folder to pop it to rename or to, to set a value for certain strings to use in your app. So right here, I'm changing the app name based on whatever I'm passing in, into the dot environment variables. And so this one's going to spark. This will just change the name of the APK if you build one. It'll just actually just change the name to whatever you pass into it. So this is using a part one. This is probably the easiest part of what I just spoke about. Um, so let's say you have two different apps. You have a, a manager and a, a your manager and a client side app, and you need them to have two different colors. So the easiest way to do that is so based off the app name, you just check whether it's the first app or the second app, and just return that these two variables being passed in at runtime will populate these, the, the, the environment config, and will handle all of that for you. Uh, next would be uh, using them. So you could pass this into the terminal, and but the, Kind of, if you have more and more, more variables, it was just the, the strain kind of would to, to rewrite this would just get longer and longer and longer. So, what you can do in Android Studio is just create your own configuration, pass in the dot defines into your additional arguments, and just set the name as, for example, flavor A, flavor B. And if you run it, it will, it, it will populate it for you. So, you don't have to think about what you need to pass in every single time. It just could, this could go exponentially longer for every variable you want to hide. Next. Um, so here's also another cool part. If you want to create a, a bundle, um, you could just write the same thing with the flavor, suffix, and any other variable, and it would create you the, the app bundle with all the variables that you need to do with um, your app for the Play Store. And then next would be, oh, so the current issues with <laughs> Dart defines, um, as always, iOS is quite a pain to handle sometimes. Um, currently, it's, it's a give and take. Uh, there are issues with the iOS side of Dart defines. Um, I've struggled myself to get it up and running. I'm still struggling. Um, hopefully, in the next version of Dart, it will kind of be fixed. But for now, it's not working that great in iOS. And that's about it. Yeah. Any questions? I know I spoke about past and I answered anything, but if you have any questions, let me know. Um, let me see. Uh, so, so one question was, uh, is this the same for iOS? I'm assuming this is uh, about the configuration. This was from Adrian. Uh, is it the same for iOS? Yes, it technically should be the same. But like I said, um, I've seen it work and I've seen it not work. Um, I'm not sure what's happening on the iOS side of things, but it seems a bit more temperamental on the iOS side than it is on Android. It seems to work. If for Android, it's always working. Um, iOS, I've done it myself, and there were times when I just had to kind of refresh the app, or I had to put my machine on and off again, or just clear some kind of cache, and then it works. But it's a bit temperamental on the iOS side. Oh. And um, 
uh, Maya basically had a comment to say that these techniques are pretty useful for whitelisting apps. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, it's white labeling app is probably the most beneficial part of this. Um, if you if all you're doing is changing a color and changing a name, but having 100% the same functionality, um, this would be perfect. Um, there is another use case uh, which I'm currently using in my personal project. So if you have, for, for example, um, if you have Uber. Uh, most easiest example. So obviously the Uber client app and the Uber driver app, let's say for example, they only sh they're sharing 90% of the code, but the, the certain front end is the only thing that changes. Um, you could essentially create two, so as, as soon as the user signs in, you can just check on which um, application ID it is, and then just send them to two different routes. But then if you sit up with using a proper architecture, a clean architecture, MVVM, MVP, block architecture, in Flutter mostly, um, you could use 90% of the code between the two apps, even though they serve different functions, you can change 90% of the code and just have different UIs for two apps and handle them all in, in a single code base. That's really so cool. I, I just want to say something for the audience. We've got chat. If you want to also ask questions in chat, you can um, you can ask type questions in the chat. You should be able to add questions. Awesome, Brad. Thank you so much for that for that awesome talk. Um, yeah. Now we're going to move on to Sylvia. Um, Sylvia, may I, may I ask one oh. more question? Sorry, before we move sure. on. Sure, sure, I do. Um, so Brad, um, are there any other ways that you can handle ENBs and environment variables currently that actually works on both Android and iOS? Yeah, the, anyway? there is, um, but it's, it's I, I think in iOS you have to create multiple schemas and Dotifine was kind of created to um, not deal with all of that p and boilerplate code. I mean, the, you can make flavors in, in Android and, and in, in iOS, but you'd have to deal with it manually every time. So you'd have to go into the separate iOS application and into the separate Android application and deal with the flavors. Um, Dartifines just kind of allow you to not deal with um, the native parts of it. I mean, you, for setting up, unfortunately, you have to deal with the native parts of it, um, but Dartifines kind of tries to minimize your interaction with the native side. But yes, you can. It's just a lot of Peter to kind of do it. Cool, thanks. Awesome. Thanks again, Brad. Okay. Sylvia, are you ready? Yes, I Over am. Um, okay, it seems like I'm sharing. Can somebody wave if you see my screen? Yes, all right, cool. Um, yes, so I'm Sylvia. I'm uh, one of the Google organizers here and I'm also, um, depending on who you ask, sometimes a tech manager, sometimes uh, a freelancer developer. It changes a lot. At the moment I do more freelance development than management. <laughs> Um, and I want to talk today about uh, CICD pipeline, um, specifically in the mobile context. Um, Yes, wait, uh, where's my mouse? I'm somehow not able, okay, now I can switch. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the theory about what exactly this is. Um, and uh, this is going to be a very personal talk. I talk about my own setup, um, what I discovered in the last few months. Uh, there are many ways to tackle this problem once you decide you want CICD, um, but I'll describe one. And then I'll walk you through a lot of code. So we have a ton of code to cover. I hope uh, I'm not frightening you guys too much. Um, but yeah, we'll see how far we get. Um, so first, what is CI-CD? Let's start with the CI part, uh, the continuous integration. Um, the idea is that as a developer, you commit very frequently, preferably daily. Uh, you write tests with everything you do. And as you commit to repo, your tests get run, get triggered automatically, you get notified if they fail. So this has like three basic advantages, I think. So first of all, as a developer, you start thinking in small increments um, and you are, you're, you're, you're kind of thinking more in, in small deliverables, kind of very closely with the, aligned with the agile approach. 
Um, secondly, it helps uh, coordinating with the team, you know, as you push early and often, you know, your teammates are following along. You don't get into these situations where a teammate goes on for the tangent, spends two weeks and then comes back with this monster merge. And then finally, if you make a mistake, obviously, you know, you, your tests will be run and you'll be notified. Um, so all of this is, you know, if you're, if you are experienced Android developer, you might have heard all of this before, you might be doing it already. Uh, if you're a DevOps person, you definitely know about CICD. Um, in the mobile world, I think setting up a CICD framework is not quite as common as it is in the dev world or, for example, for web developers. And personally, I think part of the reason is that we mobile developers think you know, we are kind of mentally closer aligned with like shrink wrap software delivery. You know, you feel like you can't update your app all the time. Uh, your users won't accept that. So you spend kind of a few weeks, a few months working on a feature and then you push out one major new deployment. Um, and I think personally, that's the reason why this concept is catching on in the mobile world, but a little slower than in, in other areas. Um, so, it's very strange. Sometimes, okay, mouse works, keyboard doesn't. Oh, well. Um, so, so far I talked about this, the I, the CI. Now let's move on to the CD. The second part is depending on who you ask, continuous deployment or continuous delivery. There are subtle differences and depends on what kind of problem you're looking at, whether it's more deployment or more delivery. In my context today, I, th I talk more about the deployment aspect. Um, by the way, I see a chat popping up. I'm not going to really read them as I speak, uh, but feel free to interrupt me if you feel like uh, you have a question. You need to kind of get Maya's attention and then Maya can <laughs> patch you in. <laughs> um, all right, so the de deployment uh, aspect, uh, the idea here is to deploy automatically, completely hands-free, and do that again very frequently. It doesn't necessarily mean that these deployments get through to your end user. You know, you don't want to bother your end user with constant updates of your app. That would be very distracting. But at least uh, you want to make sure that your app gets to a staging server uh, where once uh, your release hardens, you can have you know, QA go over it and then finally do a proper release to the end user. And you want to do that kind of as hands-free as possible. All right. It's going to be a long day. <laughs> so um, this is kind of the rough idea. We have you as a developer on this end. Uh, you push to the repo. And then from there on, everything hopefully happens automatically. You have a, a, a CI CD framework that uh, gets triggered, uh, that triggers a new build whenever uh, the repo is updated, so your code is automatically tested and built. If it builds correctly, then it is automatically deployed. If the, the build fails or the test fails, you'll be notified. All right, as I said, this is in, in for many people, this is complete standard. For some, it's not. Um, I think, so my argument today is basically as mobile developers, if we haven't looked at this before, we should. It is a great tool. All right, um, and now I'm looking a little bit at my, at my own setup. And so my, uh, my story is that um, f recently, a few months ago, I looked at exactly what Brad talked earlier, uh, Dev Defines, and kind of in that journey, I came across a really long blog post that described CICD. And you know, I thought so far, I always thought it's overkill for my projects. But I looked into it and started playing around a little bit with it and basically got a pipeline set up with my network, with my, network, uh, with, with my setup, with my, my infrastructure that I'm comfortable with. And so that's what I'm going to describe today. Um, I personally use GitLab for everything. Uh, all my repos are on GitLab. Um, that's just, I don't know why. <laughs> Can't even argue about it. That's just the way it is. Um, I currently write a lot of Flutter, but, uh, and I'm using a Flutter app today as an example, but everything I, I talk about today would be just as applicable without any change on Android. Uh, it's not really Flutter relevant. The only reason I'm demoing a Flutter app today is that it allows me to also show the iOS side automatically. Um, I'm using uh, GitLab 
pipeline and GitLab runners computational power provided by GitLab for free. Um, there are many other hosting services that will provide similar services, but GitLab has a nice integration. It works really well for me and I can so far just recommend it. One of the tools I started using in this process is Fastlane. Um, it is, I think, very popular. I've seen a lot of people talk about it. I will use it for my purposes. My only problem for this talk is I can't find kind of a catchy three-word description of what Fastlane is. Um, the way I think about it, it's, it's kind of where I used to write a shell script because I needed to massage a file and, you know, chop it up and zip it and whatever. I now have Fastlane with predefined actions that does all of that for me. So it's a bit of a convenience tool uh, that deals with uh, some use it for building. Uh, I use it mostly for deployment. And I think you'll see towards the end what I'm talking about. It's quite obvious. Um, I, the pipeline that I built can be used to deploy to Play Store or App Store. Uh, I'm not going to demo that today. Um, but I'm going to demo uh, deployment to Firebase app distribution for prototyping. I started to use Firebase app distribution to kind of get staging versions of my app out. I find it great. But again, there are other, many other hosting services that would be just as good. Um, so everything I mentioned so far, my entire setup is free for me at the moment. Um, I haven't hit any quotas yet. I will eventually, and then I'll think about whether I want to throw money at the problem or find a different service. Um, I can recommend my setup in a sense that it works for me, but there are so many other services, many of them big players in the industry that are definitely, you can't go wrong if you go with, with Jenkins or Travis or CircleCI or all the others. There are, there are lots of players. Okay, and then finally, before I really dive into code, uh, a very quick disclaimer. Um, so I said I sometimes I, I switch between a management role and an app development role. When I am app developer, I'm mostly a hobbyist, uh, kind of, you know, playing around with apps with prototypes for my own purpose. Um, and, and that function, I'm not part of the big of a big team. And that defines a little bit uh, my, my setup and what's useful for me. Um, I'm also personally, I care, I said I care more for the D than the I, which means that they, um, I hate to admit this in public, but I guess the word will go out eventually. I'm lousy at writing tests. I typically, because I write kind of little toy apps all the time, I typically never bother to write proper tests. And so I don't expect to get that much mileage out of the CI part, the, the constant integration. I do get a lot of mileage out of automating the deploy part. And that's really valuable to me. That, that uh, used to be a big headache for me. I used to mess up build versions all the time and so on. And now it's automatic and I don't need to worry anymore. Um, I also, because most of my apps are kind of sample proof of concept apps, I don't care much about release management, about screenshot upload, stuff like that. Although the pipeline that I'm showing today could be used for that stuff, I simply haven't. Um, as I said, I work with Flutter. I try to deploy Android and iOS apps, but I'm clearly better at the Android part. Um, I'm by no means an iOS expert. So what I, what I introduced, what I showed today kind of works, but don't discuss details with me. Find an iOS person who knows better about that part. Um, and then I'm currently using an eight year old MacBook Pro uh, with eight gig of RAM and like eight gig of free space, which is turns out as a severe limitation once you get into the iOS world. And so some of my choices, some of my tech choices are <laughs> kind of guided by that limitation. <laughs> And then just to get even with you guys, Docker gives me the creeps. I know how to set up a Docker image, but I always avoid it until the very last minute. So today I show you kind of a very basic setup and tell you where you should be using Docker if you wanted to do it more professionally. All right. Um, we are good with time, so I can go a little bit into, a little more into detail. So uh, there's now demo time, and this is, the, this is the moment where I would usually have little code snippets, and I would show, you know, I would run them, and I would show you what, what happened, what happens. Unfortunately, 
with this whole pipeline setup, um, every run of a pipeline takes somewhere, depending on the setup, between five and 15 minutes. So there is no way we can do this live. Um, but what I've done instead is I set up a repo um, with kind of a few very organized, well-described commits, each of them with a pipeline stage. And I'm referring to this repo now. So I talk you through code that's already checked in and I show you the result kind of as it was two, three days ago when I prepared this talk. Um, the repo is, should be publicly available. I'll publish the link afterwards. But if you search on GitLab for GitLab monkey, you will come across. Okay, now let's look at the first example. Okay, so this seems to work. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up if the font is big enough? Is this readable? All right, Maya seems happy. Cool, and I can at least make it full screen. All right. Um, so what I did here is I triggered my very, very first pipeline in a more or less empty repo. Um, and this pipeline isn't doing anything meaningful, but I think, but I wanted to use set it up just to show the concept. Um, so the way GitLab does it, and you know, every provider is different, but uh, in this case, you just define a file dot, called .gitlab-ci, YAML format. And once that's checked in, it's immediate, it's, it's, it's interpreted as a definition of a pipeline and executed. So what I, what I, the type of pipeline I set up here, I have uh, three stages, each stage, and then I have a bunch of jobs. Each job first defines which stage it belongs to. Then there is a script. So in this case, I print out a little debug info and I print my environment. And this one here, I use data excessively. This one describes the branch on which this pipeline should trigger because I don't want my pipeline to be triggered all the time. I really want it to be triggered only when there's change in this particular branch. So I tie it down to a branch I call theory. Um, I have a bunch of jobs here. One of them, this one here, is using a Docker image that has a prepared uh, a Flutter container on it, a, a Docker container with a Flutter image. <laughs> And yeah, the rest is all plain vanilla. I think the, the plain vanilla um, uh, uh, GitLab runners containers are using some very basic Ruby image. When I check this in, um, so I have here my check-in message and uh, you can see there is a pipeline that got triggered. It took four minutes and three seconds. And now I wanna look a little bit in detail at what it was doing. Here are my three steps. Um, step two had two different jobs. There was the one with a Flutter image. I think this one is the Flutter image and this one is the regular one. Uh, at each step, you can, you can look at the output. Um, so for example, in this case, start from, this, from the top. Here is my Ruby image being pulled. Um, there is my debug output. This is stage two, job one. And then there are a ton of environment variables, a lot of them kind of set by the CI uh, network. And one of them I'll refer to later is a build ID that gets ever increased with every pipeline run. It's super useful. And yeah, that's it. The entire kind of, you know, unpacking the Docker image every step and so takes a little bit. So this basic pipeline that doesn't really do any work took four minutes, but it doesn't matter if it's offline. You know, I committed my code, went off to dinner, and I get an email or a Slack notification if I want to set that up when my pipeline has failed, or I think I get even an email when it's passed, but you can configure that. All right, so far so good. Please stop me if I pass over anything you find it too, too interesting, but I will look a lot more at these types of pipelines. So this was a complete toy example. Now let's look at something more reasonable. Um, so if you look at the repo, you see that I branched and uh, made a new branch now. I called it staging. Um, I made my branch protected, which means that only I as the maintainer can check in commit directly. Everybody else has to commit via pull requests. And that has later some effect on how visible environment variables are in case I need to set up any, any secrets. 
Um, at this point, I also set up a plain vanilla Flutter app, and this is really plain vanilla. Um, this is basically what you create when you say in Android Studio, create new Flutter app. You know, it doesn't do anything. It, it does this counter example and has the Flutter logo on it. The only little twist I did is I added uh, Google uh, Firebase Analytics, and I did that as kind of a representative of a third party integration. It's kind of the simplest one I could think of that didn't require much code change and still required third party integration. Um, and then I set up with this, I set up a new pipeline. So this one is a little more real now. It has two stages, verify and test. Each stage has only one job. In this case here, I grab the Flutter, sta uh, the Flutter image and I stable one, you might tie this down to a certain version. That's a matter of taste. And then the script I'm running is just Flutter Doctor. You know, this is if, if you're not familiar with Flutter, this is kind of the standard way of verifying that your environment is correct, that you have the right libraries and so on. Um, and I want this pipeline to be executed only in the staging branch. Then in the second job, um, which is used for the testing stage. I use the same image again, and the script I'm running this time is I'm executing my tests. Again, this uh, toy example that I set up kind of comes with a really minimal test. So let's look, when I check this in, my pipeline ran. Luckily it passed. It also took four and a half minutes only. That's expected, it only has two steps. And let's look at the test. So it, uh, it unpacked my Flutter image, that's good. Uh, it started here is where, where my, my, my actual script starts. Um, executed the tests and they all passed. That's very good to know. Right. So that means we are almost done with the integration part, I think. Well, not quite. Um, the third code example I wanna talk about um, is I now need to add a build phase. So far we're doing testing, that's all right, now we need to build. Um, for today, I only build the APK. Um, building the app bundle, if you launch, I want to launch to Play Store is absolutely the same. Um, I also start using my Dart defines. I'm actually not really using them here for the simple app, but this would be the, the, the place where you'd start thinking about that part. Um, let's look at the changes I made. Yes, so first of all, I activated the third stage, um, the build stage. Um, I just, for kicks and giggles, I already put in a placeholder here. Uh, so I will eventually have more branches. Uh, I will also have a prod branch, which also should, of course, execute this, the test and so on. And, um, Yeah, I'm not going to talk about kind of the distinction between the different flavors today. I think Brad gave us a good idea. I'm using exactly the same technique in my proper app that Brad described today. And it's this this works like a charm with, with that setup. But let's look in more detail at the, the build stage. Um, so one little new thing is I added an environment tag, which I just named staging and I refer to it in my build command. So this here is my build command. Um, this is a standard Flutter thing. If you're coming from the Android side, this um, just trust me, this is kind of uh, how, you, how you build a Flutter app from the shell, um, pretty straightforward. Uh, you, you can pass in a build name. I know Brad used Dart defines. I'm just using um, this technique. Uh, but what, what, I, what was a, <laughs> an eye opener for me was this little piece here. Um, every one of the pipeline increases an ID. And I use this ID as a build number. So as a result, I never ever have an upload to a Play Store rejected again because I'm downgrading my version or so. This alone guarantees that um, my version ID is, is ever increasing. It's, it, it saves so many annoying moments for me. Um, I also here started to define uh, use dot, dot define. So for example, I always have a Firebase prefix, but since I'm not really using Firebase, this is just for show. 
Um, I'm putting all my commands right in here. Um, in my proper app, I started wrapping this into a shell script that I call from here because after a while you get very different configurations for the different um, branches for the different flavors or configurations. And I felt more comfortable managing that in a shell script than here in the pipeline. And part of it also because I want to still be able to trigger all of that uh, in my local environment. Um, and then this in, in this job is the very first one where we actually have an output um, that's defined here in the artifact. Uh, so when my build completes, hopefully there will be an APK in this place. Um, with the artifact, with the output, I can, ex I can define how long it should be kept around. Uh, normally that would be a few hours, but because I wanted to make sure you guys have something to look at, I said, made an exception and said a week. Um, when I look at the pipeline, bummer, it failed. And this is no surprise. Um, this is normally where in a live talk I would now ask if you have any idea why it failed. Uh, I kind of set a trap here. Um, let's see if we can figure it out. There it is. This is the piece. Um, remember I mentioned earlier that uh, I added uh, Firebase Analytics and I did that for exactly this reason. I added Firebase Analytics, but I didn't add a Google Services. Or typically what, what Google Services is, uh, it's a configuration file. So all, all, pretty much all third party integrations require some kind of configuration. Anything Firebase requires a Google Services file. That file needs to be stored locally. Um, in a certain place so that your build can find it. It should not be checked into the repo. Now, this is of course a little bit of a problem for us, right? <laughs> you know, it built fine on my local machine because the file was in place. Now in the cloud, it does not build. And, but the way uh, the pipeline communicated that to me was very nice, I think. Um, where is my pipeline? There it is. Um, you know, it's super quick to see. I can even see a view um, with all the pipelines I've set up. And I can see immediately which one failed, why it failed. It, I can restart it. For example, if I just messed up an environment variable that I can fix kind of on the server, I might just change, you know, add the new environment variable and rerun the pipeline manually. Um, if it's something in code, there's nothing I can do. I have to fix my code and check it in and, and set up a new pipeline. Um, all right. So as I said, this one failed. Now let's fix that. Um, and this is now uh, a nice tie in with Brad's talk. Um, he already talked about environment variables and that makes my life very easy. I, need to, I don't need to cover how to put that into Gradle anymore. So I'm using the same. Um, secrets, confidential information, I want to pass in via environment variables rather than checking it into the code. Um, GitLab provides an easy way of setting up environment variables. It provides also means to set up a file. Um, I struggled a little bit with that, um, but there is kind of a very easy workaround, which is basically here. Um, you are, in, you know, you take the file you want to upload, you encode it as uh, base 64, write it into a flat text file, and then upload that content into a variable. And then later at runtime, you kind of inflate it again and basically create you the file that you need from scratch from the content you had previously encoded. And this is this is a fairly standard um, method. And like you know, if you Google a bit, you find a lot of people referring to this trick. So this is this is the way I'm setting up my Google services. Um, I encode it locally, prepare the the variable configure the variable on the cloud server, and then in my pipeline, use that variable to inflate my file. While I'm at it, um, I already know I want to deploy later, so I also need to think about a release key. Um, so far, I'm using my, my development, my, my default key. Um, I want to describe how to generate the key. Um, that's kind of very standard Google stuff. If you, if you look at Google's intro tutorial, they explain in detail how to do that. Um, they also have this section in here. The only difference I do is I add 
kind of, I'm looking at the environment variable. So if there is an environment variable, I'll take my values from that. If it isn't, if there isn't, then I take them locally from a, a properties file that I set up. Um, so this guarantees that my code will lo run locally by, by executing this, these parts and it will run on the server by executing these parts. Uh, when you set up these environment variables, uh, I would recommend to make them uh, protected and masked because one thing you want to avoid is that, you know, because I already showed you, you can see kind of all your output um, in your pipeline and you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure your key isn't printed into the pipeline for everybody to see. Um, All right, with this little bit of extra magic, I hopefully have fixed my build pipeline. Uh, so let's look at the change. Um, I think I have two pieces here. This is the Gradle setup, and this is pretty much what, <clears throat> what Brad explained as well. It just adds a released configuration to Gradle. Again, this is completely standard, so I won't spend any more time on this. But in my build script, I added a before and an after script phase. It's basically a setup and teardown. Um, and I think I messed up one thing. I should have, I forgot to delete one piece in the teardown. Um, so what I do here is this Google services file variable I have set up on my server as an environment variable. Same with the key store file. I inflate both of those. Um, those files that I inflate here, I should take down afterwards again. Again, I should also take down the Google services file. And other than that, uh, in between the before and after my script runs and it will have all the configuration it needs. Let's look at the pipeline, see if it worked. And yes, it did. So this pipeline now took 11 minutes. Um, that's not peanuts anymore, but you know, what do I care? Uh, right. So at this point, I hope, oh, and, and there's one other thing. If I look at the last stage, I want to convince myself that I actually created an artifact. Why is this not opening? All right, here's my last pipeline stage. And uh, so, so this is all my compile, 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 compile. You know, as Android or Flutter developer, this will look familiar to you. And then uh, at the end, the output is my APK. And then that APK gets uploaded to the, 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 um, the coordinator. All of that happens kind of without any more involvement on my end. And uh, so from this coordinator, it will be available for the next stage. Talking about the next stage, let's look at number five, the upload stage. So, Upload is now getting interesting because this is kind of where I break out of my nice cloud environment and talk to an outside service, uh, my, in, in this case, my Firebase app deployment uh, area. For this, I use Fastlane. Um, I think I mentioned before, I really discovered Fastlane only now, and I think it's an awesome tool. I wonder why I missed it so long. Um, the only thing I struggled a little bit with was kind of the setup for this purpose during this talk, make sure it's all professional and looks neat because Fastlane uses uh, Ruby. I'm not a Ruby developer by any means. And Ruby requires a little bit of magic uh, to get kind of the environment set up, the packager set up. Um, you know, they, they use this bundler to make sure uh, code is reproducible. Um, I think I got it right, but if you, you know, Google a bit and if you find some blog posts because I'd recommend something else, go with them. It's all good. Um, in order to get started with Fastlane, um, this is all happening on your local machine. Um, you need Ruby installed and you need Firebase tools installed. Simply be, no, Firebase tools you only need because I want to do the Firebase deploy. Um, you say you you go into your Android directory and init Fastlane. That's all. It creates three different files. One of them is called Fastlane, and that contains the actual script config configurations. Later, I'll show you how that looks. 
Um, because of uh, because Firebase App Trans distribution is not completely standard, you need to add an extra plugin, which I'm doing here. And you also need to sort out credentials for Firebase. Um, again, Fastlane already provides support for that. It is super easy. You just run this command. What it does is it returns a URL, which you must open in a browser. In the browser, then you click through all kind of grant permissions, yada, yada, yada. If you do it all right, you get rewarded with a token at the end. And that token you put on your GitHub server, CI, CD server into a variable called Firebase deploy key. That's all. That has, that is, you know, sorted out credentials. Um, right. Um, so again, time for another code example. This one now the deploy phase. Um, this one has seven files and part of it is because when I, when I did uh, in it fast lane, it did a little bit of Ruby magic. Um, I, as I said, I'm not an expert on this, so I'll, I'll do a bit of hand waving and skip that part. And actually that's, now we don't do it the side by side. So here I activated the, the, the fourth stage, the upload stage and added my upload job. Now this is the very first job where I don't use the standard Flutter image, but I'm using a Ruby image. And I'm not even using the standard Ruby image because I also want to have gems installed. This is, I said, where I mentioned before, I was fighting a little bit um, with the Ruby setup. Um, so I had to find an image that contains kind of all the right pieces. Um, I couldn't find a, an image that also had Firebase pre-installed. So I'm installing that here. And I'm also installing this bundler, which is again, a bit of Ruby magic. Um, this part should probably eventually go into this Docker image. And, you know, if this weren't a talk, I'll probably deal with it. But for now, let's, let's just look at this. Um, at this point, I have my environment set up. I have Ruby running. I have Fastlane running. I have Firebase uh, tools running. So now I can execute a fast lane command. And this is the command I'm executing. Now, where this does this, where, where does this come from? Um, I think I need to scroll down quite a bit now. Right. I mentioned before that when you init fast lane, it creates three files. And the most important one is one called fast file. This is kind of the default configuration that they give you. I left it in, just commented out because I think it's interesting stuff, gives you an idea of how they expect you to use this tool. But I just added my, my own script. They called it lanes. Everything for them is a lane. And I defined a lane called upload Firebase staging, where I'm basically then calling their predefined lane or action already and pass in all my, my arguments. So I'm passing in my token, my app ID, um, the APK and a few other things. And that's all that's needed to upload the, the, the APK that I built before to the server. Let's just make sure my pipeline passes. Yes, it did pass, but this now is, is starting to take a bit of time. When you look at the last stage of this pipeline, there's actually not that much to see. Um, there is, so, so Fastlane is really good at kind of printing snapshots of its configuration. So if things go wrong, this is really fun to, to look through and figure out kind of where, where the wrong token got passed in or something. Um, but yeah, all it says is it's finished correctly. Um, so let's just make sure. Yes, I have a link to my Firebase setup. Firebase console. This takes a little bit. Okay, great. This is my uh, app distribution page on my, so I set up a, a project for this pipeline demo and on the app distribution. So, so this one here is the app I deployed with that pipeline number 29. Um, I think you can invite yourself to it, but there is really nothing to see in this app. But, but I believe if you invite yourself, if you later look at the slides and click on this link, you probably will be able to access my demo. 
I mean, my the, the app I set up. All right, so let's pause for a second. Uh, what we have now is kind of a complete pipeline from um, setting up the environment, testing, building, and deploying every time you commit to repo, to, to at least at every time you commit to that branch. So, so typically you would have a feature branch, you probably you know, spend a day or two working on a feature, eventually you merge your feature into staging and it will trigger this build and you will have kind of a snapshot build on, on, your, in your, on your Firebase console. Okay, so, so far about Android, um, I have only a few minutes left, so let's quickly talk about the iOS side. Um, in iOS, like Brad, I found things do get a little more complicated. Um, you can't get around Xcode. Um, so in order to build, uh, to build a, a deployable product in, for iOS, you have, it's a two stage process. So first you have to kind of build the Dart Flutter part, and then you need to archive with Xcode and create an IPA file. This has to be done on macOS. Um, it cannot be done on a Linux machine. Um, this is a bit of a problem because GitLab does not provide uh, runners for macOS. Uh, you cannot use any of their standard runners. So everything I did so far automatically triggered a runner in the cloud that's paid for and hosted by, by GitLab. This now means we have to find another alternative. Luckily, there is a very simple solution. You can, as a first step, uh, you can set up your own runner. And I did exactly that. So I installed uh, GitLab runner software on my own laptop. Um, you start it as a daemon service. Uh, you configure it, you re register it with GitLab, and then and you tag it with, with a few magic tags that you choose, and then in your pipeline you refer to these tags. Uh, you can also, I mean, I mean, I did it on my laptop because that was the quickest I could do, but you can also, I don't know, use an Amazon instance or use any other cloud service. It doesn't matter. Um, the point is you can define your own runners. You don't have to use the ones that come free with GitLab. And you can also, once you exceed the free GitLab quota, find a more cost efficient runner if you need to. Um, okay, so I will show you the registration of the runner, but I show you um, okay, so, so one thing I should have mentioned, um, I did hit a little snack here, uh, which is again, my laptop is just totally overwhelmed with Xcode. Um, it, is, it is absolutely ridiculous. As soon as I try to build an iOS version, my laptop freezes for about 15 minutes, absolutely freezes to, I mean, as a, a, to, dead as a dodo. So um, this is a bit tedious and especially tedious if this happens because of some cloud triggered event and I don't even have control over when, when I freeze it for the next 15 minutes to get another build. So um, I'm not going to show you now the real thing. Um, what I'm showing you instead is, is again a toy pipeline that I set up in the test branch where I just print out some debug info. But um, I did set it up so that I have a bunch of parallel jobs. I, I have an Android and an iOS job. The Android job runs on, on the typical, the standard Flutter image that I used before. Um, the iOS version runs, uh, uses these tags and these tags are basically tags I, def I used before when I, when I registered my own machine, the runner on my machine. So this means by, by this action here, it will run on my local laptop rather than in the cloud. When I look at the pipeline now, here it is. What you see here is a slightly more interesting pipeline now. I just for kicks and giggles, I put in a single test because I wanted to show you how each stage kind of waits for, for the results of the previous stage. Uh, in a real world, you probably have, want to run your tests on both infrastructures. I mean, it's a bit silly to only run the test on Android, but I mean, bear with me for now. Um, look at, let's look at one example. So here I want to look at the iOS version. Let's start with the top. Um, yes, so the very thing, first thing is you can see it runs on my machine. 
which you know is mind-boggling i think that you know something i triggered uh, somewhere in california now is running locally on my machine it's actually not that impressive but no. anyway um i also ran flutter doctor so you see all my laptop i wonder if you can actually see whether i had my phone plugged in so i must have i must have not had my phone plugged in at the time when I run it, but it could have well have popped up here. <laughs> and um, yeah, again, I print out my host name and then I have all the environment of my local machine. So this was now the, um, the iOS version. On the Android side, I continue to use their runners. Um, yes, and sure enough, that worked well. Um, this is their runner in the cloud and they use the, they inflate the, the Flutter image. All right, um, so this was pure theory. I won't show you how it's actually done, but I hope you get the idea that you can actually set up this kind of infrastructure for an iOS build with not too much extra effort. All right, um, I'm pretty much at the end. Um, for me, uh, in this entire journey, the question is always at the back of my mind, is it worth it to me? I mean, I mentioned before, I'm more or less a hobbyist developer or you know, single person team. Isn't this a bit overkill for me? I know at some point I had, I, I struck a problem and discussed it with a friend and he just rolled his eyes and said like, I'll just upload the thing, don't bother. Um, I have to say for me, it is absolutely worth it. Um, the, the Android pipeline alone is such a win. I mean, the fact that my deploys end up on the server automatically and then I can later decide which one I, I make visible to my testers is, is absolutely hands down a winner. And I'm glad I did it and I will definitely use it for the next project again. The iOS side is a bit of a toss up. I would have to put more work into finding a, a proper cloud service. I mean, running iOS builds on my local machine at the moment is not feasible. Um, I think it would be with better hardware. And now that I'm thinking about it, I think Christmas in, in three months. So if any of you doesn't know what to get me, I hope you have an idea now. Uh, a new laptop would fix all my problems. And yeah, that is it. Uh, here are a few resources that I used. Uh, so this one here, the Medium article, is the one I mentioned in the beginning, kind of the, the, the article that got me started on this entire journey. It's an incredible blog post. It's I think like 12 or 15 steps long. It, it, I mean, <laughs> it, is, it is a small book. Um, clearly the guy understands more, um, about Android than at iOS, he gets a bit hand wavy towards the end. He also towards the end kind of misses a few steps. So there were quite a few riddles in there, but I really worked through this. And, you know, a lot of what I, what I explained today is kind of, you know, I got ideas from him. Uh, so I, if, if you want to look into it, I can I really recommend you start with that article. If you want to look at my repo, the last link is to my repo and the QR code I think also gets you there. And with that, I hope I'll get some questions. Yes. Um, thanks, Sylvia. Um, so there is a question. Uh, does this CI CD support Huawei market store as well? I can't see why it wouldn't. Um, so it's not, uh, the question is not the, the CI CD framework. The question is like, do you find a way to upload to Huawei Market Store? So I would assume Fastlane probably has an action already. Um, I haven't looked into it yet. And if Fastlane doesn't have an action, there are other ways probably, basically if you can script an upload, you could use the pipeline. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> um, a question from Issa. Um, GitHub's pipeline, uh, actually, it's more a uh, comment. Uh, GitHub's pipelines look cool. We'll check that out. Thanks. Been using Bitbucket. Also has some pipeline functionality. Need to check that out too. Hmm. And then. Sorry, I turned my screen down to read the questions and now <laughs> pointing my camera at the ceiling. <laughs> cool. 
Uh, comment from Vickers. Uh, Cirrus CU flattered Docker image is open source, which is good, but take note that the stable version does not match any version Docker image. Yikes. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then a question from Ether. Do GitLab's pipelines have limitation on build time for free users? Uh, MS App Center, for example, e.g., only allows 20 to 40 minutes build time per month. Also, Firebase's app distribution is limited to Android, right? Uh, no, Firebase is not limited to Android. I'm using it for iOS as well. Um, I am not sure if on the iOS side, if you upload an IPA file or an app bundle, uh, but it does work. The limit, there is a limit on GitLab. I just last night, very timely, got an email from GitLab that they're increasing the quota from 1st of October and it's, I think, 400 minutes now per month. Um, so, I mean, with my own little uh, development thing and with preparing this talk and kind of, um, you know, if, <laughs> if you look at the repo, you see a very organized uh, uh, commit list, but <laughs> There are a lot of commits <laughs> that went into this before I managed to clean up. <laughs> um, and I haven't hit the quota yet. Uh, I also, I was looking to find out where I am with my quota and I couldn't find it, but I'm sure it's somewhere accessible, I hope. It must be possible to find out how much minutes you have left. Um, but from 1st of October, you get 400 free. I think for, for a larger team, certainly at some point you will have to pay for it. Um, but I also think, you know, that kind of expense is justifiable because you do get a lot of benefit out of it. Cool. Uh, I think those are the, all the questions. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Uh, that was an awesome presentation. Cool. Uh, Maya, over to you. Okay. I was just reading the questions to make sure if there aren't, weren't any questions that we missed out. So another opportunity, if anybody wants to unmute, uh, wants to open up their screen and wave, we can take more questions. And also we'll put the links to the um, slides. Um, we'll put that in the chat and we'll probably, we can post that on the meetup as well. And then are there anybody, is there anybody else who has another question for Brad? We'll take flatter questions. We'll take any questions now. Uh, yes, no, we're getting a lot of, okay, thanks. Great. Here, Vickers, what does Vickers say? Vickers wants a question. Vickers, uh, let me see if I can find Vickers and we can unmute him. Ah. Developing in Flutter, do you guys use Material or Cupertino theme? I know one is for Android. Who wants to take that question? All right. So Material is for Android and Cupertino is for iOS. Um, my personal projects, I mainly stick to Material, but honestly, if you're working with a designer, it's kind of up to them. Um, Flutter also does have adaptive widgets. So you would say, for example, um, switch dot adaptive, and it will render the appropriate widget for the platform you're on. So you'd get a Android switch on Android, and you get an iOS switch on iOS. So it's either based up on your own preferences or based on your UI designer. Okay. Any more questions? While you're thinking, oh, switch adaptive, do you get issues regarding fitting in the app screen? Uh, for something that small, no. Um, I don't think there's any widgets that I've seen personally that has caused issues for the adaptive ability. Um, most thing, the, the only thing I really struggle with fitting in, in, in Flutter, which is really annoying, um, it sticks, uh, Flutter doesn't by default the wrap text. So you often have to put it into a column or a row or some expandable to kind of do that. But, but for the adaptive uh, widgets, I haven't found an issue with putting it in the app, in the app screen. So I find, um, I agree with you, Brad, that you know there isn't like an issue up front. Um, 
I still find developing for Flutter a little bit different in that aspect. I mean, you do in Android, it's very difficult. It's very, it's very kind of natural to define different layouts for different screen sizes. And, uh, you know, you, you simply, you know, arrange your fragments differently when you have a large screen. In Flutter, you have to kind of be more conscious about it. And you end up with quite a few, if, or at least I do end up with quite a few if statements in my code where I kind of, you know, prov provide a different layout when it's landscape. Um, and yeah. I think I have to be a lot more conscious about that. Yeah. Um, it's also, you kind of have to be conscious if you're doing Android Bib, and you have to be even more conscious, uh, conscious about um, the size of components. Um, but for now, I've mostly, in production, I've mostly just worked on apps. And besides sticks giving me an issue, I haven't really found anything with the, with the overflow issue. It's mainly dead fixes giving me an issue. Um, next question. Uh, with Apple having no back button. Yeah, that is quite, <laughs> that's quite a big pain. Um, with with, with um, iOS, so the app bar does provide a, a back button and that's kind of what you just kind of have to use to handle going back. Um, there's a package called auto root. Um, I highly suggest learning that and I, and I had to use that. That's quite convenient for routing in Flutter as well. But yeah, Apple not having a back button is quite a big pain. Um, I, I really can't give advice with, with that one. Um, what do you do with that on Flutter? Because what is this a back button on our device? Okay, we have someone who wants to ask a question. Okay. Take it away. Yeah. Hey, Brad. Hey, Sylvia. Thank you for your talk, first of all. It was um, absolutely insightful. Um, so my question relates to more to being a Flutter noob, first of all. So uh, one, of, one of the clients that I'm currently working on, um, we have an application that is developed natively for both iOS and Android. Um, and obviously ha writing your applications natively means that you are troubled with inconsistent or misalignment between the two platforms, right? And obviously using something like Flutter um, will ensure that you can uh, mitigate these uh, misalignments. So the question is more so uh, being at the stage that this client is or this, or this project is rather, uh, we can't go and rewrite the entire application into uh, Flutter right now, um, but we can change maybe one portion of the application to Flutter and um, um, uh, kind of a massive sect of the application uses a website so it's being rendered through a web view so basically the question is can that section of the application that's currently being rendered through a web view be developed in a flutter application and then that flutter application be embedded inside of the native application have you ever covered or done something to that effect um, i know it can be done um, but i haven't been in a situation where i need to com kind of combine the two uh, we are with yeah. certain parts of it is Flutter and certain parts of it is Android. I would highly suggest doing it though, um, purely because you you can kind of handle the performance on it and the UI look on it would be much mm. better. Um, yeah, no different. But uh, we have done something like that now. Okay, cool. But Thank I you. think you look into it though. Yeah, I'll, I'll try it definitely. Tomorrow. Okay, we have another question, Vikas. Hang on a moment. Yeah. Is Vikas? Ah, Hi, Vikas. Hello. Hi. Hi, Vikas. Sorry. Sorry, it's easier to speak than to type. <laughs> um, I don't know if Jacobs is still here, um, but I know with the... Um, the integration between the two with native and Flutter, you can use the pathing and with web, it works quite well and with the apps as well. So then you can divide it by, so I can say partially rewriting it in a Flutter if you don't have to do it the whole app and it works quite well. And you can pass, um, as far as I understand, you can do pass uh, contexts between each other. So I don't uh, know if Jacob's going to reply, but I've, that's, my side, I, I know that Brad, you said you don't I haven't tested yet, but I have, and it is, it's working quite well. Okay, cool. Oh, See, replied. Yeah. Do you, do you use platform channels to communicate between the two? No. Um, so I use that on the server side, so that the server actually do the communication between each other, and then you can also use your root as a part of co communicating it through. Okay. And That's then it's client cool. side. Yeah. Awesome. Um, sorry, Brad, I don't want to align the back button. 
um, but I know that, for example, with the scaffold, right, you get the leading where you can, where you can replace like a default back button, right? But the mm -hmm. issue comes in if you have a keyboard and the keyboard pops up on the screen and then you get a situation where the keyboard takes on trend, like the whole screen, then you can't use a back button on the software side to actually go back. Yeah, that, uh, honestly, that needs to be quickly implemented. Um, right now, I think most of what I've seen online is more hacky jobs to get it working than any like official kind of like, hey, yes, I handle this. Um, it's just kind of going through Stack Overflow and GitHub posts and, and GitHub issues to kind of do it yourself. It's very hack at the moment. Cool, thank you. Yeah. We've got some questions from Vickers, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Tim, if I just throw something at Vickers. Yeah. Real quick. So Vickers, you mentioned that you've uh, sort of embedded a, 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 a communication between a Flutter application and the native application. Um, how, would you, how would you sort of handle that in terms of, uh, does your Flutter application then be sort of compiled into like a framework that you then call from your, from your native application? Um, because main, mainly if you, if you look about it, not necessarily communicating with the server, maybe it's just adding any content to begin with, right? Um, the, the website side of things that's, that's currently taking forever to load um, because of internet issues, we could rewrite that into a content page um, uh, with hard-coded content for now and then just call that framework or rather that view controller or that activity or, or, or fragment rather um, that's now sort of a Flutter application in native. Does that, does that make sense? Sort of that's Kind of the, 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 the thinking that I'm, that I'm sort of alluding to. Um, Jacob, to be honest, um, the best way you can do that is it depends on your native environment you're using, so the difference between web, iOS, and Android. But if you go check in the code that um, Flutter generates for web, iOS, and Android, you can see how it starts the process for Flutter. So what you can do is you can take that out and then put it in your native application code, and then you can spawn the segment that you want to use uh, for Flutter yeah. code, and you can pass that on as you want. And you can do that for web, iOS, and uh, for Android. Nice. Okay. I love that. Thank you. Cool. Um, Brad, I've got a question for you if, if somebody else doesn't have a question. I think you want as a question, but sure, if I hear. Um, on the Flutter side, with the pub spec and the Android um, XML, you need to specify what's the minimum SDK and the maximum SDK. But in Flutter's documentation, they specify that even if, because the, the whole UI is being rendered pixel by pixel, it's not like a native application. So why is it needed that you need to define a minimum and a maximum SDK? Uh, I think just because it does render to Android, um, for, some, for some of the, the, the plugins, so what they are actually using native code and, those, and that code has a minimum and a maximum um, SDK requirement. So it's not that Flutter needs it, but more that the, the, the packages you're using as a dependency on those native code. So yeah, it's, that's kind of the, the uh, thing right now. Um, so it's not that Flutter needs a Flutter, like you can run your application right now with Flutter, um, a bare bones one and it'd be fine. But if you're using a third party package and it has some dependency on some native code and that, and that native code has a dependency on a minimum SDK, you're going to have to then update your minimum SDK to support that one package. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your effort. I appreciate the session. Thanks. No problem. Um, I see you, Johan, is having a question. I'm not sure if Johan is still in here now. Hi. Yeah, there is. Oh, Jan, I see you. Your question was to deal with <laughs> a action when you get a data notification. Yeah, so if you, if you send a push notification from your server to the app, yeah. Um, and the app is not running. Yeah. What I would like is to trigger um, a, a background process to go and, and fetch something. So the push notification would have a property that says, let's say this is the URL. Yeah. And um, the app then needs to know what to do with that, uh, um, uh, with that data property. And it goes and downloads something so that when the user taps the notification or when the user opens the app again, uh, yeah. They don't still have to wait for, for the download. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, block, with the block architecture. Yes. Um, so you can actually create, you can actually encapsulate your notification logic inside of a block. And the, yeah. the notification, you can then just trigger an event from there. 
but how do I get but how do I get the the notification to cause the method in the block to run when the app is not running? Yeah, that's a, that's a bit out of scope for me. Um, right, now, all I've done right now, specifically what I've personally done is just encapsulate my notification um, logic inside of a block. But then to run a, I would think, I, I would say I would just assume that as soon as you, um, if you're using dependency injection, then just calling the block inside of your or your background call, and then just firing off an event from there, and hopefully, um, but I'm just I'm speculating at this point. Hopefully, they'll just kind of do what you want to do from there. Sorry, I, I didn't get how you would get a, a background process. Uh, so, so, when, so when you're registering your notification uh, background listeners in Flutter. How, how do you do that? Um, the, is the, if, you, if you're using the, FC, are you using the FCM. Yes. Yeah, um, just give me one second. Um, and and look at um, Android server sticky services, and that will do the job for you because that's a permission you just need to accept, and then this, the, it will receive the push notification even if the app isn't running. Is, is right. that a Flutter package or what is that? Uh, I know that's. I think that's. Android, eh? Yeah, that's I, may be, I may be a little bit of a noob in this department at least, um, but. I know from the iOS side of things, or at least this is this is the uh, the industry that I've touched. Um, you can't necessarily execute the background service from a push notification per se, right? You can you can definitely show the push notification. You can store that data and you can access that data when the application is started, but you can't execute background services to be running at least from iOS um, and a native project um, when your application is in background. You will have to do that the moment your application comes back to foreground. Now I know that Android offers messaging services. So when you register your, your, your uh, Google Cloud messaging um, uh, interface handlers or, or, or and whatever, uh, whether using Firebase or whether using TCM um, directly, I think TCM is decommissioned in any case. Um, you can at least, you have a running service on the Android side of things, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure, right? So, but at least in my experience, you can't do that in iOS. I, I, I completely believe you, but, but here's the question. How does WhatsApp do it? WhatsApp actually, in my opinion, this is this is how I would see WhatsApp. WhatsApp actually sends a pre, three components, right? The a push notification consists of a, a title and a detail title. So also described as a title and a, and a description. And then obviously it's got the data payload. Now the data payload is, um, as far as I've used it at least, it doesn't, it doesn't have a limitation on the amount of characters. So you can send a, an, an issue if you want inside of the data payload. It's just another JSON object that you're passing along with your push notification. The moment you open your application via this push notification or not even via this push notification, um, it will just display the contents of that push notification uh, that's embedded inside of the data payload at least. That's how I would assume, and, and that's how I would do it at least. Look, look, so I, I, I'm, totally I'm aware right. that, that so WhatsApp there is doesn't a limit use FCM, um, so they're not limited by the 2K or 4K limit that you have with FCM on Android and, and iOS, because they use their okay. own push notification infrastructure. Um, the, the question that is still in my mind is something needs to be running in the background to process this um, mm. notification that comes in. So my suggestion is I see somebody just posted a link to a Flutter local notifications. Local package. notifications is something different. Yeah, that's, yes. that's completely um, But I'm, I am currently using it to get, um, to, to, push not, to push in a notification. So I'm using it in here. So we, if, uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay, so right here on the on background message, as soon as so as, so as I configure this, you know, in my on, on the on background message, you can actually just if you just do your if statements here and then from here you can probably run some kind of event that would pass. I, think, I don't think you can do a network call in the background, but you can probably um, do something that is local. You can probably write a case or something. But yeah, but, but those are not oh. local notifications. I think I think I think Johanna, it's a combination of local and and actually the remote.
notification right yeah. so remote yeah. notification will obviously just display the message a, a remote notification is either something that's being displayed or it's something that that just contains a payload or both right you define how you want to set that up but if you configure your remote notification to have the content let's say for instance um it has an id to something and i'm, I'm sort of just um sort of uh, developing this off the top of my head right you have you have an id of a message right that's stored in your database uh, you will send that as a data payload and then in your in inside of your local push notification uh, when the honor remote message is then received you'll perform your networking call assuming that background networking is enabled and possible at all depending on the platform um, then when you've actually received that massive payload from your server then you send the local push notification to your device all right i get what you're saying um, yeah, it, I, I don't have happiness around this yet. Um, I, I still think I need to, to walk a path to find a, a proper solution that, that's going to work long term. But yeah, yeah thank you. If, you. if you do stumble across a solution or some problems, um, I'm on the Zero Tech Slack group as well. Um, you can reach out to me and we can liaise a, a solution if anything. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Okay, that about wraps it up. I just have one more announcement to make. We're not going to have a GDG meetup next month because it's DevFest. So DevFest, there's, there'll be some announcements on Twitter and there'll be some announcements on ZA Tech and some links coming up, but DevFest is next month and then our next meetup will be um, in November. And I think that was all of my announcements. Yes, and then there's the feedback form. I've posted that in chat. If people can just fill in the feedback form for us, please. And with that, I'm done. Over to you, Ahmed. I don't know if you want to say anything else. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone, uh, for attending. Uh, and Sylvia and Brad, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the, the engagement at the end there, uh, like the different questions. Um, Seems like Flutter is really a uh, really popular, a fan favorite. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you again, and thank you to everyone who attended. Um, and that is it from us, from all of us at GDG Cape Town. Okay, so now I'm actually just going to leave the chat on. So if people want to talk about other stuff, like what they're working on or what they're doing or whatever, if there's anybody else who's got more questions, if you've got, I'm just leaving the chat. I'm just leaving the meet up for a few more minutes. So those who want to go can go and those who want to stay and talk can talk. Cool. Okay, cool. Okay, everybody's saying thanks all. Yeah, I don't think anyone has any more questions. I'm allowing participants to unmute anyway. So if anybody wants Sophia? to unmute themselves. Yes. Um, what attracted you to Forstlin? Um That's an interesting question. That was the first one I came across. Um, it was referred in, in quite a few blog posts. And, you know, every time it was about uploading, it seemed so easy to set up. And, yeah. I had no reason to look at something else. It's not a terribly qualified answer, I know. But <laughs> okay, okay. And is there an internal story that we don't know about the Docker uh, scale? <laughs> um, no, that's um, it. Just um, Basically, the type of work I do, as I said, I'm, I'm in my day job mostly um, in a managerial position. You know, I have my team set up stuff and then I understand it and that's good enough. They, are, they prefer if I don't mess with their work and we can all live with that. Um, in my private life, then I try to understand things a bit deeper and mess with it. But then I typically look at more kind of small type toy applications that exercise the problem without really getting too involved. And because of that, it seems that uh, for my own life, Docker is overkill all the time. You know, it's so much quicker to just, basically by the time I'd be ready to set up a Docker image, I lost interest in that problem and I move on to something else. Um, so <laughs> that's all. <laughs> I do agree it's a great tool. Um, so if I, if I need to set up something, you know, for, for a professional client, I would use it for myself. I don't use it all that much. Okay. 
um, I don't want to burn something, but um, maybe that's why the Apple is so slow because I, I tend to see if I install everything on my <laughs> my system left and right and I just display of it, then my system will yeah. also get slow and I try to keep my system clean and then I push everything. On yeah, that, that is, uh, you have a good point. And so basically I'm very seriously approaching a purchase and on my next machine, I will be more disciplined. I think you, you have a point, but also my machine is so slow because it has about a few hundred gig of photos and music on it. <laughs> Understand. Anyone that have maybe a solution for us who don't have apples and stuff who's developing on other OSs and then releasing for Apple, um, except for a hacking uh, Apple VM? I would be looking for that as well. So, so if you troll the internet, pretty much uh, every kind of medium post or so ends with like, oh, and then you set up an old Apple mini and it seems like people have them lying around. Um, I don't. <laughs> um, uh, but, what, yeah. Uh, well, I can I can have a uh, maybe a comment here. Is the thing that I'm, my Mac Mini that I have lying around um, is not coping anymore. It's got eight gigs of RAM, and two of that goes towards video. So mm -hmm. it's really got six gigs of RAM. It, it 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 just dies when it tries to run Xcode, and and I am keeping it clean. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's a 2011 and it's just, it, it just can't. Mm. Um, so the solution that I'm looking at now is to rent a cloud Mac. Um, it's legal, it's you pay for usage and um, you get a Mac in the cloud that you can start up when you need it and then kill it when you don't. So um, this, uh, I've just actually started Googling this again uh, about an hour ago or so, and then I remembered about this meeting. Um, but yeah, so there are some solutions that let you pay by the hour. Hmm. Do you have a link for that um, Mac in the cloud? Um, if you Google it, you'll find you'll find a hundred of them. I'm I'm actually looking for one right now that will really let me rent by the hour and not let me pay sixty dollars up front. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. But I do agree that's probably um, something I will also look at. Um, you know, I think I think a cloud service for that kind of build problems makes sense. Uh, Sylvia, maybe a future toy is to try Fastlane and Docker. <laughs> All right, challenge accepted. <laughs> No, I, I, I will definitely, and um, yeah, <laughs> there are only so many hours in the day. <laughs> Should I update you on my progress? I can just maybe fork your rip, but that's fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Anyone else with any questions? Your kid seems unhappy. <laughs> There's no extra Mac lying around, that's why. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Right, um, um, well, I, I have to be off. Just um, one last reminder about the feedback form. If you have just uh, one minute, just to fill that in. Uh, the speakers, and we would really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you for the yeah. opportunity. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Okay. I think we can end, right? Adrian has to go. Yeah. We can end. Okay. Cheers, everybody. We'll see you online again. Uh, yeah. Maya, can you quickly stay behind? I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, I think we are now all private. No, we aren't. I'm going to stop recording.